MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. There's always been a question as to whether or not long COVID symptoms are the result of the virus surviving or even reproducing long-term somewhere in the body. Before us is a case that I think is very interesting for a number of reasons, and it was recently published, and the title is Persistent SARS-CoV-2 Nucleocapsid Protein Presence in the Intestinal Epithelium of a Pediatric Patient Three Months After Acute Infection. The patient was an 11-year-old female with no known comorbidities, and she was diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 positivity by PCR. Shortly after that, she developed abdominal pain. At first, doctors took a history, and they ended up treating her with something called a proton pump inhibitor, which is often used for gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is not uncommon in the pediatric population. The pain was described as crampy and burning, and it got worse with either eating or stooling. The patient said it was anywhere between a 5 to 7 out of 10 in terms of intensity. Now, while the patient did have nausea, the patient denied any vomiting, weight loss, diarrhea, blood in stool, joint pains, or skin changes. And these are important symptoms to know because they rule out other potential causes. Now, they also did a number of blood tests. They did a complete blood count, which measures the white blood cell count, the hemoglobin, and the platelets in the blood, and that checked out to be normal. They also did a complete metabolic panel, which checks electrolytes and liver enzymes and things of that nature, and that actually turned out normal as well. They checked something called a erythrocyte sedimentation rate and a C-reactive protein. Those are tests that look for nonspecific causes for inflammation in the body, and both of those were normal as well. They checked for trans-tissue glutamase, which is an antibody that looks specifically for gluten allergies, and that was normal. They looked at total IgA, and that was normal. They looked in the stool for something called H. pylori, which is a bacteria that often causes issues with the stomach like peptic ulcer disease, things of that nature. And that was negative. And finally, they looked for something in the stool called calprotectin and vitamin D. And as it turned out, the calprotectin levels were actually quite high. As it says in the article, it was around 358 micrograms per gram of stool and normally it should be less than 100, so quite elevated. And the vitamin D levels were actually low. It was only 14 nanograms per milliliter as opposed to where it should have been, according to their scale, at 30. We at medcram.com actually have a course that tells you all of the ins and outs about the CBC and the CMP. And we have also talked quite a bit about vitamin D levels and the associations of SARS-CoV-2 infection with low vitamin D levels. In fact, we have a video specifically on the topic of COVID-19 and vitamin D, which we will link to in the description below. We've also recently produced a video about light in general, and specifically daylight, for which vitamin D is a marker. And that video goes into the specifics of near-infrared radiation and its effects on the oxidative stress inside of cells, and specifically the effects in COVID-19. Of course, we'll put a link in the description for that as well. So to quickly review, we have an 11-year-old female who was diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 positivity by PCR. She's had three months of abdominal pain, crampy, burning, worse when eating, worse when stooling, a little bit of nausea, but no other symptoms. And all of the lab tests are normal except for calprotectin levels, which are high. And calprotectin levels are elevated as a surrogate marker for neutrophils, which are white blood cells and part of the immune system. When they come into the intestinal area, they get basically this protein becomes leaked out into the stool and it can be picked up and measured. And finally, a low vitamin D level. Now, it should be spoken about that this patient is actually from New York. It doesn't say what time of year this happened in the article, but given the fact that this patient resides in New York, would make her at increased risk for vitamin D deficiency because of her high latitude.
So because these symptoms had gone on for three months, the patient had both an upper endoscopy, which is basically a scope that goes down the mouth and into the esophagus and stomach, and also into a portion of the small bowel. But also the patient had a colonoscopy, which is a lower endoscopy, and the patient's colon was examined. According to the article, the patient's upper endoscopy was completely normal. However, there was friable tissue, that means uh, tissue that was very easily damaged and inflamed down in the colon, and so there was some issues there, and we'll take a look at that more carefully right now. But before we do, let's take a look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus anatomy. Here we see a virion, which is made up, of course, of the spike protein, which is this blue spike protein. There is the membrane protein, which is this uh, part here, purple. There's also the single-stranded RNA, which of course is this dark purple squiggly line that's going here in the middle. But the thing I want to look at even more importantly here is the nucleocapsid proteins. The nucleocapsid proteins here you can see are these red proteins which bind to the single-stranded RNA in the viral particle. And it's important to understand this because these nucleocapsid particles or proteins are unique specifically to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so if you see these proteins or antibodies against these proteins, you can know for sure that the patient has been infected with SARS-CoV-2. So when they did the colonoscopy, they took biopsies of that area, and they prepared it, and they looked at it under the microscope. And what you're seeing right now is the results of that biopsy. And you can see here in B, let's look at B first. What you'll notice here is these things here are generally speaking normal. They should normally be there. These are the parts of the intestine that allow for absorption and you can see cells that are lining this area. What is not normal are the number of cells, as you can see here, in this interstitial space, lamina propria, they would call it. And these represent many lymphocytes, which is usually indicative of chronic inflammation. On some of these slides, what they did was they prepared antibodies that would show up under light microscopy if they would bind to those nucleocapsid proteins that we showed you earlier on the slide of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Here you can see that in A, the antibodies are actually binding to nucleocapsid proteins. And you can see this discoloration here on the slide that is different than over here because on B, they did not stain for those proteins, but over on A, they did stain for those proteins, and clearly you can see that that's exactly what you're seeing here under A. That's the only difference between A and B. So that's interesting. If we look at C and D here, this is completely different tissue to give you an understanding about how this nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2 looks. This is actually placenta. And here on the left, under C, we see a placenta which has been infected with SARS-CoV-2 and stained as such. And so you can see there's a lot of this nucleocapsid protein staining that is there. And then when it is done the same over here on this side, we have a negative control in this situation where in this placenta there is no known SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's pretty clear that we're seeing inflammation in this slide. We're seeing a lot of lymphocytes that have come in here. The timing of the infection is right after SARS-CoV-2 positivity, and we're actually staining for the very unique and specific protein that is only seen in SARS-CoV-2 infection. I thought this was an interesting case. Number one, because it was in a pediatric patient without comorbidities. And so it's pretty easy to say that this is what it appears to be, because typically in 11-year-old children, you don't see a lot of comorbidities or things that confuse the issue. Secondly, I thought it was interesting because of the vitamin D deficiency. I think it would be interesting to see in more studies how common vitamin D deficiency is in patients with long COVID symptoms, and whether supplementation improves the symptoms. And as we recently discussed in our Light as Medicine video, there is the possibility that sunlight has much more to it than just vitamin D, and that vitamin D might be a marker of appropriate sunlight exposure and therefore its deficiency, the lack thereof.
The authors of this study did not say whether or not the patient improved or whether or not she got vitamin D supplementation, but they did say at the end that there are a suggestion of possible therapeutic interventions, including vaccination, monoclonal antibody therapy, or corticosteroid therapy. And of course, they propose that further studies are needed to evaluate the impact and frequency of persistent gastrointestinal SARS-CoV-2 infection and to correlate symptoms with the severity of disease. And it's interesting that they mention that because there has been some anecdotal discussion and evidence based on survey that at least in a subpopulation of long COVID patients, that there was some improvement after vaccination. And if you or anyone else you know are suffering from long COVID symptoms, please see our video on long COVID as we discuss possible therapeutics and an evidence-based method for improving the inability to smell. Until next time, thanks for joining us.